My name is Chris Bowling. I'm actually a pediatrician from, uh, in greater Cincinnati. I actually live in the Kentucky suburbs, which always confuses people, but we're sort of like Washington, D.C. We go across, the, our beltway goes through three states. So my practice is in the Kentucky suburbs, um, and I've actually gotten involved with obesity stuff over the years. Um, my practice is about 20 years old, but I've actually uh, been doing obesity work for about the past eight or nine years. Um, so what I'm talk, going to talk about today, and this is a little bit of a hybrid talk. I, in 45 minutes, we can't be all that interactive, but I also don't want to, we've also been sitting and listening to a lot of lectures, so I want to make it a little bit interactive if we can. But I'd like to talk about Be Our Voice, which is a program that um, I participated in with NicheQ, um, and also kind of give you an idea on what the program is about, but also give you some of the tools that we exposed our obesity prevention advocates to who went through Be Our Voice. So let me tell you a little bit about it to start off with. First off, though, I'd like to also thank Charlie and Shika and Sandy, who are all here. Also, another uh, friend, Kim Edwards from Austin, who um, uh, was involved with Be Our Voice as well. Um, there were pretty clear objectives um, in what we were trying to do um, when we presented about Be Our Voice. We want to talk a little bit about community-based action. We'll talk about some partners that you might engage. And we'll do a little bit of work so you can kind of start identifying potential partners if you're interested in this kind of work. So what's the challenge? You know, Charlie mentioned it. We're trying to figure out how we as healthcare providers or those of us involved in whatever we do aren't out there by ourselves. You know, there's a lot of people who are interested in pediatric obesity, thank goodness, very different than it was 10 years ago, but um, we can't do everything by ourselves. And some people who, we were just talking about it right before we got started, that there are some people that, you know, don't, uh, have a very strong voice that you might not even recognize that they have such a good voice. Um, and connecting with those people to kind of help push things along can be very, very important. There's another reason, you know, we all know the health, the health costs. Charlie hit upon this a little bit. One of the reasons, I mean, NICHQ is involved for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons NICHQ is very involved with it is NICHQ really looks at um, healthcare quality and efficiencies, and the costs of obesity are kind of staggering. Estimated to cost $14 billion in annual direct and indirect health expenses. Children in Medicaid account for about 20% of that. Um, annual obesity-related hospital costs for children and adolescents were $238 million in 2005, doubling every year between, two, doubling between 2003 and 2005, and the rate has continued to go up. Um, NICHQ's strategy for doing this has been fairly clear, um, trying to improve assessment, prevention, and treatment of obesity, help healthcare professionals in becoming advocates for environmental improvements that will help obesity prevention efforts. And also, NICHQ has sought to kind of be a resource for physicians and community members who are involved in change. So Be Our Voice is one of many things that NICHQ has done. Um, and actually, here we are right here where Be Our Voice has kind of come to an end. It still exists in certain ways, and we'll talk about ways that you can still access some of the materials. Um, and like I say, we're going to go over some of the principles of it today. So Be Our Voice, along with other current NICHQ initiatives, what Be Our Voice was, was an initiative to train and engage healthcare professionals to be effective advocates pr for pr promoting environmental systems and policy changes for childhood obesity prevention in their communities. So we're not talking about the big piece here is, you know, we all know that we can change one patient at a time, hopefully, but what we can make it a bigger impact if we can change the environment that we all practice and live in. So we're really looking at how can we as healthcare providers be empowered to make those environmental changes. Be Our Voice also focused on certain parts of the country and it focused on my home state, Kentucky, but it also, we had people from Mississippi, Alabama, New Mexico, two groups from North Carolina, but they really focused on areas in the South. But what we learned from these groups where the need was highest are a lot of lessons and learnings that we can apply elsewhere. Um, NICHQ has a, a, an overarching philosophy, and we'll kind of go through this very quickly, of integrating across sectors, focusing on family-based prevention, using a quality improvement approach, 
having a strong support structure in place, and again, promotion of policies, systems, and environmental changes. The six strategies that, that NICHQ uses to change communities are development of a community action plan, use of consistent messaging, in, participating both in and outside the healthcare setting, which again, we're talking about, you know, we're all kind of healthcare connected folks, but we're going to affect real change when we're able to cross cut and get out of those silos. Um, the healthy weight plan that, that Charlie mentioned a little bit, and then also building capacity of communities to be able to make change. So what do we mean really by environmental change? And I think a lot of us know this, but it's worth it to kind of go over it again. It's where a child lives, goes to school, um, it's for our families, where they interact, where they shop, where they meet each other, where they play, et cetera. Um, and currently, our, we all, these are things that we all know, there's lack of physical activity in school, we have a car-focused world, there's lack of availability of fresh fruits and veggies, and there's massive marketing of unhealthy foods and vegetables. There's an overabundance of high-density foods, things we all know. Um, we also know that we have a lot of unhealthy behaviors. 79% of kids ate fruits and vegetables less than five times per day during the seven days before um, this study of the youth on the, as reported by the Youth Risk Behavior Study. 34% um, were drinking soda or, or um, soft drinks at least one time per day during the seven days before the survey. So we have a lot of dietary patterns to overcome. We also know that 65% are not meeting recommended levels of activity, 46% don't have ed physical education classes, 35% watch three or more hours of television, and I think you know that's even a, a low number. When we look at some studies from the Nielsen Company, kids between the ages of two and six in 2010 were averaging 32 hours of screen time per week. So you know that more than four and a half, about four and a half hours per day of screen time in kids between the ages of two and six. The kids between the ages of six and 11 were still at 28 hours per week. So there's some really huge challenges to physical activity um, and uh, dietary patterns that we're trying to overcome. And what we're really trying to do is change the environmental mil milieu. Let's think about this a little bit when we think about when we're talking about a patient individually and what we're talking about them when we talk about them from an environmental perspective. Let's think about a 12-year-old girl, we've all seen her, um, in for a well check, um, who reports that she's beginning to get teased and bullied a little bit about being fat. Her BMI is at the 90th percentile for her age, and uh, it's 23, which puts her in the overweight category. One way of thinking about her is to think about, you know, if we think about the socio-ecological model where we talk about individual and child characteristics, the, her family unit and her community unit, we can think about her in different ways. We know from a behavioral stamp, standpoint from her diet, she skips breakfast, she eats pretzel and juice for lunch, after school she stops at the corner store to buy something, she eats out with her family three times per week, and while watching TV in the evening she eats some cereal. So when we think about her on an individual basis, it's somewhat affected by her schedule, it's affected by her dietary intake, it's affected a bit by the feeding patterns that were established in her family. So that's one way to think about her dietary habits from a purely behavioral standpoint. Now let's think about her from an environmental standpoint. She skips breakfast, Again, same, same patterns, eats pretzel and juice, after school snack at the corner store. But if we think about her from, a, from an environmental perspective, there's a corner store, there's high accessibility of convenience foods and, uh, and restaurants. Some of her parent food preferences factor into it. Food availability in the house is part of her environment. Her school lunch program, her school schedule factors into it. So all of these things, you know, when it was just a few circles, when we think about her from an individual behavioral standpoint, it's just a couple of things. When we think about her from an environmental standpoint, it's a whole lot of other things. So you're really broadening the perspective when you go from thinking about pers a person's behavior on an individual level versus an environmental level. Let's think about her physical activity patterns in the same way. She doesn't have outdoor time. She has three hours a day of screen time. She has a lot of homework. 
She has weekend on the weekends she watches TV nonstop, and she her extracurricular activity is cheerleading a couple times per week. Okay, so from an individual standpoint, a behavioral standpoint, her parents monitoring of her TV, her parents encouragement of her activity, her own personal decision making, and her own personal schedule. So again, very personal, very individual kinds of things. Let's think about the exact same behaviors. Thinking about it from an environmental standpoint, we then start thinking about the crime rate in her neighborhood that limits her activity. We think about her school physical education program that limits, her, that limits or allows physical activity. We think about her availability of recreational activities, her activities at home, her school schedule. So when we put all of this together, um, it's really an interaction of all these things. And by thinking about things that are affecting one child, a one 12-year-old child, it's a lot of personal things, but it's a whole lot of environmental things. So thinking about things from an environmental perspective, we really broaden and really complicate our, our viewpoint on her. So we really, when we're talking about this, this is where I think a lot of times we as healthcare providers, I know for me personally, I always get a little overwhelmed when I started thinking about environmental change because you'll get like people who will say, oh, it's availability of corner stores. Oh, it's unsafe neighborhoods. Oh, it's lack of transportation. It's all these things and it just gets absolutely overwhelming. So when I show this slide, what we're talking about is just like, it's, it's complicated. Um, and it is not um, easy to say, okay, we're going to do this one thing. But I would also say that small differences make a change. You know, we, we know, and this is a little bit getting at what Charlie was saying earlier, that it's very hard to use BMI to move the BMI needle. We need to look at some of our individual mo movements that we're, that we're doing, and they're worthwhile. So where do we come in as healthcare providers and healthcare agents in trying to change this overwhelming tidal wave going, coming at our kids? Well, healthcare professionals have a really important role to play. Um, we have a different voice than anybody else in the community, not the only voice, and sometimes not the most effective voice, but our voice is very important. Um, we are generally viewed as being pretty neutral. You know, we can kind of say things without being political one way or the other. We can say things because we're respected for our neutrality. Um, so you want to use your own personal Switzerland story to go out there and, and make a case. Um, you can also, I, I don't want to understate the importance of your own personal stories. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, can recite numbers and data, and that's very powerful and very important, but there's nothing like an individual story to tell. I have one story that um, um, I'm going to bore you with, probably, but for me, it was a very moving story. Um, a patient of mine named Andrew, um, and Andrew... Um, I had been working with him for ages and ages about his weight, um, and it kept going up and up and up and up, and his father had developed type 2 diabetes. I always tell the story of Andrew because he's somebody who really changed my view of weight management. I had assumed after he, it, when he turned 17, he decided to lose weight. He started exercising. He started eating more healthy. He had a very regimented diet structure that he, that he embarked upon and had great success. So he came in afterwards, and I said to him, I said, Andrew, so what, I, I assume you saw your dad getting, you know I, know, I know your dad developing type 2 diabetes probably scared you into, into losing weight, and I'm really proud of you that you did this, and, you know, sometimes we have to have those wake-up calls. And he said, Dr. Bowling, that's not at all what happened. He said, what happened was my dad's developing diabetes had something to do with it, but I was trying to demonstrate to him that he could do it also. So what I took as a very like self-preservation story was much more powerful than that. It was about him trying to help his father. And I think those kinds of stories are stories, for me, it was a pivotal moment for me in, in, in driving home that what I think is important isn't important all the time. But, and the kids are a lot more noble than we give them credit for. But um, I think those kinds of stories, we all encounter those. Those are important ones to, sh to share with legislators and, yeah, and others because that's really what we're encountering when we're out in practice.
Um, the characteristics that I would say that we as healthcare providers have is we have that credibility that I was mentioning. We have strong relationships with community members, um, people that you, you know, members of your chamber of commerce, other physicians at the, at the hospital, all sorts of people. We have a skill set that actually we're pretty good at certain things. I mean, some things we're terrible at, but certain things we have really pretty good skill sets that d help us uh, develop trust um, and inter uh, interaction with others. And we also have some strength in numbers. You know, it used to be that there weren't that many of us that were involved, but the number of people at our conference today, there are loads of us out there. So you're not alone. There are a lot of other voices that people will be hearing. So adding your voice to the, to the, to the chorus makes a big difference. Um, the question I always get is, okay, yeah, that's great. I've got a patient every 15 minutes. How in the world am I supposed to fit this into my practice? And you can't always. And there are times in your professional life when no matter what you're doing, if you're a physician, a social worker, a nurse educator, whatever you are, there are personal things that happen that prevent you from being able to do everything you think is worthwhile. It doesn't necessarily require a lot of time. You can, the statement here is you can affect as much change in, a, in as little an hour as some people will do in multiple hours per week. I spend a lot of time doing obesity work just because I really get turned on by it. I'm a full-time pediatrician. I spend an off day a week, almost all day, working on pediatric obesity stuff. I just, I, I feel like it's something I really want to do. That's not for everybody. It depends on how much time you can commit to it. And if you got an hour a week, you got an hour a week. There's nothing wrong with that. That can be a very powerful hour per week. I'd also say you really want to prioritize your interests. You know, there are going to be times you're going to get scatter grammed with every opportunity. Can you do this? Can you do that? It is very appropriate to be focused. For me, the classic, and, and I love, let me preface this by saying, I love the Girl Scouts. I got asked to be on the Girl Scout board, and I thought, that's great, sure, I say yes to everything that I think is a good organization in my younger years. Um, I never had a girl, I've never been a Girl Scout. Um, my only connection was I like cookies, and my mom was the Girl Scout pantry. So, you know, it, they're a great organization, but you know, at this point, I kind of prioritize a little bit. And I think that's completely appropriate to do that. Um, you have to know where your voice is gonna be loudest um, and embrace that. You wanna really cultivate partnerships with key stakeholders. And those are gonna be different completely on what community that you're in. A strong stakeholder in one community is a non-entity in another, in another community. Taking the time to try to figure out, and you're gonna guess wrong a few times, but taking the time to figure out who are the real power players and who are the real stakeholders around these issues is critical. Particularly when you move from small policy decisions or small advocacy roles to the bigger ones. Like, and what I mean by that, small P things, are small P policy changes are things like something you do in your office or something you do with your local scout troop. Big P policy is changing the state mandate on high school requirements for physical education. Testifying in front of, you know, for a, for a state legislative task force on obesity. That's big P policy. So there's little P policy and big P policy, particularly with the big P policy stuff. You really need to know who the appropriate stakeholders are because you can really waste a lot of time, get very frustrated if you don't do your homework on who really is pulling the strings here, okay? I've made this mistake a few times, I'm speaking from personal experience here, not realizing the first time when I went charging in about you know how important it was for physical activity that I was really hacking off some important allies in the teachers uh, association. So you just have to know who the stakeholders are first. The other thing I would comment is we can be earned media machines. I had a different phrase here. I had earned media whores, but I kind of toned that down a little bit because we can really be powerful voices and that can be in television appearances. It can be in lo local community presses. It can be in your bulletin 
um, your church bulletin. It can be in all variety of places. But earned media, what I mean by that, is sort of free media, not media that you pay for advertising. It's media that you earn through your activities. So it's, like I say, it's, a show, it's an appearance on the local talk show, or it is talking in front of a school group sometimes, or it is getting you know, on the radio station um, about the upcoming health fair, or it is a press release with an organization that you're working with, or a letter to the editor. But it's something that you get, and I tell you, healthcare providers can get that. Use those titles can, can mean a whole bunch of nothing, but that the one place where they can really be powerful for you is when you're trying to get out there. So use your bully pulpit that we all have as healthcare providers. You know, what did I, what, what did, how did we get started in Cincinnati? Well, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but we, several years ago, we started a collaborative to prevent childhood obesity, and this was the, the um, logo that we came up with. It was a local group of doers, lots of energy, lots of ideas. These were educators, physicians, all sorts of people. Lots of optimism, no money. Um, we went through the whole thing, like, oh, we have to have this really... We, we made our history statement. We had a whole list of who we were. Everybody was signed on. You can notice there's a complete lack of any corporate sponsorship on this list. <laughs> um, we, um, you know, we really were into using the socio-ecological model, talking about our environmental change. We really, you know, and we did a lot of gr really good hard work. We came up with a very comprehensive vision statement and plan. Um, we had our guiding principles. We really were affecting, wanted to affect all these different areas. We had a very complicated and very well thought out communication strategy. And then the crickets were chirping because there was no money. We had this grand plan and nothing happened. So what did we do? We were all discouraged for a little while. We kind of went through this whole process for a while and, and nothing really happened. Um, so killing time. We sort of talked with other people. We heard what Columbus had done with their advocacy and policy plan. We talked to foundations and businesses. We scoured grant sources. But most importantly, we were patient. We just kind of hung out. We kept meeting. We kept talking. We kept refining. And then what happened? The financial crisis occurred in 2008. And one of the things that happened was, through the American Recovery Act, there was a need for shovel-ready projects. And our county was one that got the Communities Putting Prevention to Work grant, which then led to um, a very alert, Ham Ham Cincinnati is in Hamilton County, a very alert Hamilton County Health Department putting in a CPPW grant that then bore we Thrive, which is our local initiative, which provides for um, community gardens. Um, it was seed money for us to start more stuff around the city in terms of walking school bus. We did an improvement collaborative with our physicians in terms of screening for obesity. And, and, and I like to think of my role. I, my role was peripheral on this. I didn't write the grant. I didn't do anything else. But as a healthcare provider, I was utilized as sort of the voice of the medical community. And, you know, I talked with other people. You know, I'm a physician, I'm a pediatrician, and I wasn't even living in Hamilton County at the time. I, my appointment was with Children's Hospital, but I actually lived outside. I was on the Kentucky side of the river. Um, but that's okay. I mean, we were able to, you know, you can make things happen. But being patient and being observant is really critical. Biologic systems are messy. Sometimes the places that you think are going to be slam dunks for certain things are complete dead ends. Other places are very fertile, and there's all sorts of unintended consequences. And possibilities are kind of endless. There may be no initiative in one particular area, but there may be huge momentum in another one. So being open to possibilities. Could your plan, could your advocacy be defending PE in school? Or could it be promoting walking and cycling to school? Or could it be in that park expansion? I, one community that I work, have worked with, and actually they did this all on their own. This was no help from us. They had already done all the work. This was Winchester, Kentucky. Small sort of exurb of Lexington, Kentucky. It's about 20 minutes away from Lexington. Um, and it 
is pretty rural. Um, they have, through sheer willpower, they did what's called an intention path. Does anybody know what I mean by an intention path? They had a, a group of dedicated people who knew that they needed a sidewalk from the school to the shopping area. There was no sidewalk. So they started an intention path, very willfully walking back and forth on the side of the road, making it a big muddy trench, back and forth, back and forth, recruiting people to go back and forth, getting walking clubs, until city council was like, that looks like hell. We need to put in a sidewalk. They got their sidewalk. You know, very on the ground, you know, really boots hitting the ground, quite literally, creating environmental change. Um, they also went on to do what's called a walking path. Um, they had a big open area um, after the sidewalk was built. Um, Winchester started building. They, they said, wouldn't it be nice if we just had a path cut through this big, beautiful, if you've seen Kentucky horse farms, they're gorgeous. This big piece of public land, they got someone to mow down the hay and create sort of a walking path, a circuitous walking path through this thing. People use it all the time. All the time. Because it's in a really good spot, close to a lot of people, good walking access to it. Very on the ground, very local, very small P policy, but powerful. Um, when you engage with community action again, just saying the same thing over again. You can be a very powerful voice when you do this. You know, why is community action important? It's because you really are able then to move beyond individual change. And I'm not minimizing individual change at all. That's very important. It's a huge piece. We all are individuals. We all live individually. But you can really do things to support the 12-year-old girl who I mentioned earlier by really engaging around those sort of community type activities. It also, collectively, we can really, like the intention path I was mentioning, we can really um, connect, uh, we can get the attention of some of the decision makers and make a change. Um, anyway. So we're going to talk a little bit about personal calls to action here. I want you to think about these three questions for a moment. Have you ever attempted to bike to work only to feel it was unsafe? Have you ever attempted a walk where there are no sidewalks? Have you ever sought fresh produce or unprocessed foods only to find that you could not find them? Okay. How many people have done number one? Okay. How many people have tried number two? All of us. How many people have tried number three? Yeah, common, common occurrences. So common opportunities that are out there. I'd like for you to also think for a second, you know, thinking about your own community, and take off the hat of like what's, don't be practical for a minute. Be sort of starry-eyed and idealistic for a minute. I want you to think about a six-word bio. Um, you know, think about six words that define what you would like to see for your community from an obesity strategy, from an obesity standpoint, okay? So, you know, you hear six-word bios that people say, you know, like, for me, it's baby doc, ice cream, travel fiend. So, you know, it's like six words that describe me. So think about six words, a six-word bio for what you would like to accomplish in your ideal world. What would you like to be known for in your community from an obesity prevention or treatment standpoint? Okay. Anybody have one? Can I think of one? Anybody want to share one? Thank you. I got one, but it's a little, it's not as tight as you might be looking for. No, uh, it's good. In the community, what I would do is I would uh, do surveys um, and scientific results and get some earned meaning around it. I'd ask a pediatrician to speak on behalf of what we just discovered. I would have a media campaign that would be targeting some kind of behavior change. Um, okay. 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 Good. So, earn media, pediatrician, ad, or physician advocate, or healthcare advocate. Yeah, I'm in a lot of control, and what we do is we'll do like a community survey, and then we'll 
sent out a press release that these are the results. This is what <coughs> most of the people said they were in favor of having this ban or that ban. And then we would always get, you know, three or four physicians to, or, you know, people, stakeholders and physicians to get up and speak at the press conference in behalf that would be supporting this language. So what turns you on is data acquisition. What turns me on is a comprehensive approach. Comprehensive approach. So you've got media going and you've got you know, community stakeholders, you know, research, supporting, really targeting certain themes and changes that you want to see happen in the community. Mm -hmm. So comprehensive approach. So doctors are doing their job at the clinical level. You've got a media campaign supporting behaviors, that, the outcomes that we're trying to get to have happen. We have earned media that's also getting in there. And we also have policy work. You have somebody passing laws about you can't have that store that's selling all that food, you know, right that right next door to the school. You gotta So sort of like comprehensive approach resulting in real outcomes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. like almost empowering them. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Access and hope. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And what's your community again, Donna? Rockport. Rockport, yep. Yep. Great. Great. Yes. Equitable opportunities, safe environments, and human design. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. I wrote down link groups for visible action positions. Excellent. Excellent. So you can even make them as specific as you want. You know, sometimes it's like build building a sidewalk from here to there. You know, so it's from from this place to that place. One of the th tools that I want to kind of point out to you, if you're looking to incorporate 5210 into your, um, uh, into your policy ideas and plans, this is the PAPO, or the Policy Opportunities Tool, the Pediatric Obesity Policy Opportunity Tool. And this comes from the AAP. The easiest way to find it, it's really hard to find it otherwise, go to aap.org and search for PAPO. Okay, or if you just Google source, source search POPO, P-O-P-O-T-A-A-P, you'll get here. And this is the obesity matrix. So basically what this is, let me show you. It's kind of hard to see here, but this is five, two, one, zero, breastfeeding BMI screening. And across, we've got practice level interventions, community, schools, state, and federal. So what happens is if you say, hey, I really am turned on by school policy around physical activity. So that would be one hour of physical activity, schools, you'd go here, you'd click, and what you would find is references that you can use with people to talk about this, policy statements, um, uh, literature references, and then also ideas. Like, hey, here's what Rockport has done with schools. Here's what so-and-so has done with schools. Here's an idea around increasing physical activity in that school. So the PAPO is a great tool. And it also, like I say, it's also built out down here for breastfeeding promotion and for supporting BMI surveillance in these different levels. So like, for example, again, if we're looking at um, um, uh, reduction of uh, sweet drinks, zero, and we're looking at the federal level, you would click here, to find results on and links to how about how would you do a soda excise tax? How would you do, you know, change in farm policy? Because those are federal level aimed at zero. So that's what the ma matrix does. It's a nice little tool. Um, it's also important to know you're not alone. Um, you know, it's very important to be 
to be thinking about your community and think sometimes your 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 um, most obvious partners are not your most productive ones and conversely the ones who you think have no connection at all have a huge connection to obesity either because of personal reasons or other other things going on um, you know choose common interests um, balance resources against challenges. These are some catchphrases here, and I don't mean to gloss over them, but I want to give us some time for questions also. Um, who knows what CBPR is? Okay, so CBPR is Community Based Participatory Research. And the reason I bring this up is when you're talking about community engagement, um, so you'll hear about CBPR. And some of this stuff won't even be given the name CBPR, but that's really what you're doing. This is an area that grew out of action research. And what this means is it's, we're interacting with communities, finding what they want, not only what we think as healthcare providers they need. You know, we may go into a community and say, oh my gosh, look at this data set. This community totally needs to do something about stroke. We need to do something about stroke in this community. Whereas CBPR goes into a community and says, hey guys, what do you think is going on? We've noticed these numbers about stroke in your community. What are your thoughts on this? Um, it acknowledges that the communities need to help themselves. And I also like to think of it as also almost motivational interviewing on a macro level. It's not going in and being prescriptive from the ivory tower going out and saying you need to do this or that. It's what do you as a community want to focus upon. Um, the reason I put in here the CTSA, the National Institutes of Health supports a lot of CBPR type activities which are very, lend themselves very much to um, uh, policy and advocacy, advocacy kind of projects um, through what's called the CTSA or the Clinical Translational Science Awards. So for those of you who are in one of those communities or close to those communities, you can find those on the NIH website and might be a little bit more prone to that. And the other research too is CDC sponsored veterinary care studies? Yes. Thank you for knowing this. Yep. Great. Keeps going. Because it's what they wanted in the first place. So the important lessons, the obvious connection is not always the most fruitful one. You know, you want to figure out what, who are your best collaborators. Your content expertise is sometimes most valued out of your own area. You know, we go through this, you know, and I'll start throwing out terms like HEDIS and CBPR and I think everybody understands what's going on. Those are things that, you know, we talk about all the time as healthcare providers that a lot of people don't know. We can have a very powerful voice and bring some really unique perspective to things that you kind of take for granted. Integration at the strategic level that informs integration at the family level is rewarding. What do we mean by that? It means that um, we need to be thinking about our strategy, where, how we're going to accomplish it, and not only about, um, it, and, that, and that doing that really brings it down to individual families for us. Um, just a quick statement that PDSA cycles and the, the model for change is a great way of doing this when you do community advocacy work, trying something, trying to determine what you're trying to accomplish, trying it on a micro level, and then measuring what happened. See if you really made a difference. You know, on a thing like improving snacks in a daycare by using a PDSA cycle. You try to introduce them, you start serving more of them, you have them bring in more stuff, you see what kids are actually eating. And if they're not eating it, then you make a change and you see if there's something else you can do to promote that. So you just constantly try something, put it into place, see what happens, and then change it and try it again. Okay. So one last little exercise. Okay, there's our resources too. Let's go back to this for a second. So you kind of identified your community, and like I said, we ran through this very, very quickly. But I want you to think about one small step that you might take when you get back. You know, who's one partner that you might contact? What's one issue that you might investigate? And it might change completely over the course of the next several weeks or months. But one small step 
that you would think might be a potential place to head from this. So I want you to just think about that. I want you to head home with that and think about acting upon that and think about what kind of partners you might pull in, what kinds of things you might do. A small step makes a huge difference. If I say, if you have questions about the BR Voice materials, this is Hillary, who's from NicheQ. Um, if you contact us uh, or contact me, we can get you in contact with the BR Voice materials and guides if you have a very motivated community. You're looking for some advice on these issues, small P policy, big P policy, the PAPO, um, how, what are some strategies for getting earned media? What are some opportunities? Feel free to contact us either through the NicheQ website or through my personal email. Um, the Popo is a great one. Like I said, the easiest way, you can see why I don't put that one up very often. Just go AAP, Popo, Google it, you'll get right there, and it's the matrix that you're looking for.